Chairman McFarland, the Union of Concerned Scientists has reported that the reactors at Diablo Canyon and San Onofre are out of compliance with the NRC's fire safety regulations and have been for some time now. The Union of Concerned Scientists believes the lack of NRC enforcement of fire safety regulations is one of the biggest threats to nuclear safety in this country. Now, that's a very strong indictment that they are making. Why does the NRC allow plants to keep operating out of compliance with these fire safety rules? That's what the Union of Concerned Scientists say. Do you agree with that? Do you allow plants to keep operating out of compliance with the NRC's own fire safety regulations? Thank you for the question. Um, and I appreciate the, the concern raised by the Union of Concerned Scientists. Um, Every plant in this country is either in compliance with the fire safety regulations or they have taken approved or compensatory actions. One moment. So, so the NRC has provided them with an alternative to the regulations, is that correct? Sorry, can you repeat the question? So the NRC has provided an alternative to the regulations? In other We've, words, some of them are operating without being in full compliance with the regulations, and you've given them an alternative. We've given them uh, a potential alternative actions that they can take to make sure that they are safe in terms of a fire. Let me ask uh, Commissioner Postolakis to elaborate. Uh, as I said earlier, I'm sorry. It's okay. Um, Appendix R was the original uh, regulation that led, because of its inadequacies, to this National Fire Protection Association standard. The standard is voluntary. About 35 licensees, again, if my memory serves me, have agreed to enter this standard, and once they enter, they cannot get out. Now, as they find maybe inadequacies according to the Appendix R, uh, when they are implementing uh, NFPA 805, there is enforcement discretion. We don't penalize them for it as long as they tell us what they're going to do about it and by when. These are minor things, and usually there are compensatory measures. There so what? I'm sorry. Maybe that's what they, there are compensatory measures to account for these weaknesses. So. It's not that they don't comply with the regulations. I mean, the, there is this period where they will be allowed to take action to correct whatever mm -hmm. uh, weaknesses they have. One minute. Yeah. Well. I, I'm confused, I have to admit. I'm sorry. <laughs> Forgive me. So my understanding is that the NRC has fire safety regulations. Are these regulations or are these just a idea that you're putting out for power plants? If they want to do it, they can do it, and if they don't want to do it, they don't have to do it. Is, Chairman? They are. Oh, I'm sorry. <clears throat> I'll no, there, there are regulations in place. So they're not voluntary. They have to. No, yeah, they are. Okay. So um, I don't know how many are on this list here, by the, but it must be, let me see, 10, 20, 30, 40. How many? 17 states, about 31 reactors that are not in compliance. And what I'm hearing from you is you give them, they come forward with other ways to get you to forbear. And how much time do you give them to comply? To comply with the regulations? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let me turn to Commissioner Apostolakis or Commissioner Magwood. I was, I was going to try to um, give an Jeff. illustration that might clarify this a bit. Um, part of the, the rule, the regulation that, we're, that fire protection falls under is called Appendix R in our lexicon. And under Appendix R, for example, we look for the separation of say, you know, uh, control cables. And control cables would have to be a certain distance apart or be protected by some barrier or some combination of the two. Um, an alternative to actually moving the cables further apart might be to station a person 
um, at the location or to have a person check yeah. every half an hour at that location <laughs> to make sure there's no fire taking place. That's a compensatory measure. And that's the sort of thing a lot of the licensees are doing. And those, those measures can stay in place for, for quite some time. Well, from what I know about my own, the reactors in my state, there's personnel problems there by the handful. Somebody's supposed to be someplace they're not. Somebody falls asleep. I just want to say this is concerning, and I don't think you're that concerned, all of you, but it's okay. It's a disagreement. I feel you need to get these plants up to code in terms of we would not allow this in, would not allow this in a lot of areas. And I'll tell you something. I served as a county supervisor, and you better pay attention to fire regulations. I was just at the Democratic Convention, which was great, in parentheses, and you should have seen the fire marshal there. Seriously. Whoa. Get out of the aisle. I don't care if you're on CNN, MSNBC. You get out of the aisle. They told senators and everybody else. This isn't something we should be giving them compensatory ways to do it because then you're putting it in the charge of a human being and we know human error occurs in the best of people. So I guess what I'd like to do is not today because, sir, this is kind of the first I've really learned about this, and I want to thank you for this. Um, I would like to work with all of you to figure out a way. A, I think the people in these communities ought to know that their uh, nuclear uh, power plants are not in compliance. Let them start to write letters and say, hey, get into gear here and fix it up. I've got problems. I've got problems in California. I've got my two power plants on here. We've got enough problems. We not only have the problem with the tubes, we've got this problem. So what I can tell you that I'm going to work on with my colleagues on both sides of the aisle is sending you a letter in short order that uh, I think we need transparency. I think you ought to chastise these folks by just having a website and say, hey, go up and see who is in compliance. Let's have the good list. This is the thing that always gets me. There are so many people who are doing the right thing here. And then they look over and they're spending the money making the capital improvements and then you have people who are putting it off until something happens and then they'll have an excuse and they'll say, well, the NRC said we could compensate, blah, blah, blah. And I don't want to get you into that situation. So not today, but in the next few weeks, we will we will do a letter with some of our colleagues, hopefully on both sides, that just says, please bring the attention of this failure um, to comply with your own regulations uh, to the people, because my sense of it is, the minute my city councilmen know and my mayors know, they're going to be on the phone to, to the PG&E in the one case and SoCal Ed in the other and say, hey, hey, we don't accept this. Um, it's not right. So anyway, I just want, I don't want to end in a down note at all. I think we can work on this, and I, I really thank the staff here for all their work on this. We'll get this done. And, and I want to question on another potential danger that was recognized several decades ago, and the Commission took steps then by issuing regulations, which is my understanding may not have been fully implemented, and that is the risk from fire at a nuclear plant and the impact it could have on its uh, generation capacity uh, to prevent uh, the, um, uh, the uh, pr appropriate cooling of, of, the, uh, of the nuclear material. Uh, can you bring me up to date uh, as to where we are on, uh, on uh, proper protections at our nuclear facilities from the danger of fire? Sure. Thank you very much, Senator, for that question. Uh, nice to see you again. Good to see you. Um, Welcome to the committee as a confirmed chairman. Thank you. Chairman. Thank you. Um, in terms of fire, the staff has issued a fire protection standard and is working with licensees to implement this standard, and, and many of the licensees are actively involved in implementing this standard. And I invite my colleagues to uh, elaborate if they would like to. Also, if you could comment, because I believe there were regulations issued several decades ago. It's my understanding that not all the power plants are necessarily in, in full compliance with the of those requirements. That, that's yeah. correct. And, but. Uh, fire was identified as a significant contributor to risk a long time ago, 30 years maybe or more, 
and of course the fire at Brown's Ferry in the 1970s sensitized people to it. And at that time, the first regulation was issued, the so-called Appendix R to the Code of Federal Regulations, which was very deterministic and based on experience. Uh, for example, you know, critical trays should have 20 feet of empty space between them or a fire barrier and so on. And that Appendix R turned out to be very difficult to implement, and a lot of the licensees complained. I believe we reached something like uh, granting like uh, more than about a thousand exemptions, and any time you have a, a thousand exemptions, that means the rule is not very good. So then the National Fire Protection Association, and we participated in that, issued the standard, uh, which is now called NFPA 805, which is a combination of uh, probabilistic and uh, deterministic methods, more modern than uh, Appendix R, but it's voluntary. And I believe last time I heard 35 licensees or around there uh, have agreed to do this, and have, some of them have submitted already their uh, re-evaluation of the fire risk. Our staff is reviewing those uh, submissions. Uh, and I think it's primarily licensees that felt that uh, implementing Appendix R for them was very difficult or for whatever reason they didn't want to do it. Well, I would just make this observation to, 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 the, to this committee. Uh, you have a responsibility to do everything you can for safety, and this committee has a responsibility on oversight, and we work together. Uh, the tragedy you referred to, I believe, was in the 1970s, so it's, it's far removed from the current thought process. If there were a, a fire at a nuclear plant that put us at risk, I would expect we'd be having a hearing today on the fire risks. I don't want to have to have that hearing. I want to make sure that we have in place the, the, the precautions that are reasonable to mitigate or eliminate this risk factor, uh, and I would just ask that you keep this committee informed as to how that review is taking place. Uh, I, I, it just disturbs me that there are nuclear power plants that are not in compliance with a regulation or there are a thousand waivers that have been issued. You're absolutely right. We need compliance and we need regulations that provide the protection and are uh, achievable. And I would just ask, uh, Madam Chair, that this committee be advised as to the progress that you're making in regards to this area. And uh, I think uh, Chairman uh, McFarlane uh, mentioned uh, hydrogen control in her opening remarks. Did you? Did you? Okay. Well, you should have. No. They're, they're, they're in the written statement. There you go. Uh, I, I just want to ask uh, uh, Commissioner Apostolakis, uh, her reference to a hydrogen control in her opening remarks, in her opening statement, not her remarks. But uh, could you explain for those who might be watching or listening to this hearing, may not be familiar with this topic, what, the, what does the uh, NRC actually mean by hydrogen control? What is the current practice in the United States? And uh, what uh, the practice in some of the other countries uh, who use nuclear power currently is? Just give us a primer. This would be, I'd call it, Hydrogen Control 101. <laughs> well, hydrogen is flammable, so uh, we should not allow the accumulation of hydrogen gas anywhere because then you will have an explosion or a big fire. And I believe uh, we have a regulation, 5044, that uh, deals with that issue, uh, and it the intent is to prevent the accumulation of, of hydrogen, or if there is hydrogen, to do something about it before it reaches, let's say, a critical mass. Uh, I don't know what other countries are doing. I'm sorry. Does anybody else want to comment on that? No? Commissioner Osterdorf. Certainly the uh, buildup of hydrogen, as Commissioner Postlakis, uh noted, is a concern. Uh, just, you know, in submarine experience, you never wanted hydrogen to get above 8%. And to have a safety margin factor, you never allowed it to get above 4%, assuming you'd only detect it by a factor of two error, just, just as one example. And so we had 
carbon monoxide hydrogen burners to remove the hydrogen from the atmosphere on the submarine, primarily associated with the ship's battery. Uh, there are hydrogen recombiners that continually burn hydrogen in some of our nuclear power plants that are always functioning to keep it below a certain threshold. Some of the hydrogen that uh, we're talking about from explosions at Fukushima were associated with zircaloy reactions. Uh, when that zircaloy fuel, fuel became uncovered, high heat situation generated hydrogen, and that was uh, the inability of uh, the plant to vent that hydrogen led to explosions. This has been a primary uh, emphasis we've had on the reliable venting orders we put out in March for our boiling water reactors, Mark 1 and Mark 2. All right, that was good. That was hydrogen 1. That was like 101 and 102. I thought that was very good. Thank you. Thanks, Madam, uh, Madam Chair.